right, so as you can see, it is uh, it is dark, meaning it's nighttime. I'm heading to class. Uh, I just I worked all day. Now I'm going to head to class. I'm going to head to class at UCSD. Uh, we, Cal State San Marco last class was like two weeks ago. Now we're heading to UCSD. Uh, Drop the kids off. They're eating dinner. Now it's time to go to UCSD. Last day of class. I'm so proud of our kids in our community. I know we're doing big stuff in Lemon Grove, and oh. I'm excited to see like how we continue to grow. So. How does this work again? You press play. Yeah, I did. And your car's towed. If you're group one, raise your hand. If you're is that a threat? Five, this is for the cops. Can you repeat okay. that again? I need somebody from group one over here presenting. Whoever that is, come. That's why I'm going to videotape me for a minute. Just show you where to send it. Can I finish it? Can you see how every. Can you see how every. Okay, so there should be some other kind of white people, right? I am happy to be here. Are you saying that for the camera? Are you saying that for the camera? Are you saying that for the camera? Get those oh, look, I'm matching my mask. <laughs> oh, hey. Do you consent to being on camera without suing me or asking for anything? No, money? absolutely okay. not. Okay, Sorry. put your mask down because people have been saying that I might fake this. There you go. She said no. I love your presentation. This is stunning. Uh, okay, well, it's going. All right, so mine is on the power of the Latina administrator. Um, I had a QR code in case you wanted to pull it up on your phone, but thank you to Monica, that was her suggestion. Thank you, Monica, that was fabulous, but we will need it. So, <laughs> the power of the Latin administrator. Um, so, go to slide two. So, basically, um, in California, well, in the United States, we know that Latinos, the rising numbers are way up. Yet, um, we know that they're the second fastest growing ethnic group, and in California, 
most of the kids going to school are Latinos, right? But sadly, um, we know, what we do know is that they, in California, Latinx students currently perform at much. Where they were teaching in a in a face to face and and a, and a hybrid modality that they then turn around and go, okay now. Um, title four is this paper is um, the case for undocumented students in higher education. There's a code if you wanted to follow along, but it's okay. We're not doing what we're supposed to. So, and the introduction. Case talk so far right now is exploring exploring leadership impact on campus based programs and community colleges serving students who experience foster care. Uh, so, this is just a little background about what we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to do the introduction, statement of the problem. And then these are the buckets that I have worked on uh, during my, uh, during my, my uh, literature review. And then of course, we're going to conclude with impl uh, implications for social justice leadership and further research. So, um, first I think it's important um, for me to talk about uh, positionality uh, because I am a former foster youth. Um, this is actually the apartments I grew up in when, when we first removed from my mom. Um, and went into foster care. And the reason why I bring that, I, I bring this up is because I don't believe positionality is a, a limitation. I actually believe it's what helps me, uh, makes me an expert in this. Um, and uh, so students experience foster care are also referred to as foster youth, right? A lot of times they're removed from their homes uh, for a variety of different reasons, but the, 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 the most common reason is either because of physical abuse or neglect. Those are the two reasons that a child is removed. It is possible for a child to be removed for emotional abuse, but it is extremely rare, extremely rare. Uh, it almost never happens. So it's important for you to also understand that uh, abandonment and be becoming an orphan can also get you into foster care as well. Um, so I have a friend who spent 18 years in foster care because his parents had died in a car crash. Uh, unfortunately, he wasn't adopted uh, at the time. Uh, and to be honest with you, uh, sometimes adoption even uh, plays on uh, what race you are. So that, that led to him actually staying in foster care a lot longer. So that's, um, I wanted to give you guys a little understanding about what a foster youth is and my positionality. So uh, this is the, the, the problem statement. So let's just read the last one. Uh, there's a need for deeper uh, support by way of identifying the impact of campus-based leadership and its effect on students who identify as foster youth's ability to obtain their educational goals. 3% of foster youth graduate from college. That's extremely low compared to their counterparts. And so when we have 3% of foster youth graduating from, from college, we have to, from, from uh, a bachelor level. When we only have 3% of foster youth graduating at a bachelor level from college, we have to ask ourselves why. Why is this happening? And why did this 3%, why has it been like this for the past 20 years? Some of the research has shown that it's between 3 to 11%, depending on what state you go to, but 3 to 11% is still extremely uh, low compared to, the, compared to our, uh, their counterparts, right? And some of this has to do with a lot of foster youth, they deal with uh, challenges that most populations do not, uh, do not have to encounter, um, such as uh, some of the, the uh, this thing called ACE scores. ACE stands for, if anyone's ever heard of ACE, ACE stands for um, Adverse Childhood Experiences. And basically what uh, ACE score does is it measures uh, the, the amount of uh, uh, turmoil and challenges that you've been through and how it affects your, your life. It's a study that was done by Kaiser Permanente. Um, they began to study uh, families and what they found was the higher your A score, the more probability of you uh, uh, not accomplishing uh, some of the milestones that most adults actually accomplish as they go through life, such as obtaining a driver's license, a job, et cetera, things like that. So uh, example of an A score, uh, so for me, I, I believe it's out of 11, so for me, I have an A score of 10, 10 out of 11. That's extremely high, right? Um, most foster youth have either 11 or no less than eight, right? And so. Uh, on average, right, and you compare this to, to, to people, uh, to other people, right, I'll give you an example. My children only have an A score of one. That's it. All of us have an A score. It does not depend on your race, your gender, or your class. All of us somehow have an A score, but from going from 10 to one, that's a drastic change. So our foster youth are dealing with A scores of 10. So it's important for us to figure out how can we address this challenge that they're having. So in my literature review, a few different sections I talk about, right? And the, the first section I talk about is foster youth academic achievement. 
and I, I mentioned the three percent, how it's extremely low. Well, one of the reasons that it's low is because the majority of uh, 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 a vast majority of false students aren't even graduating from uh, from high school, right? So when they're entering into high school, they're not they're not uh, properly prepared even for college. So the majority of them are going to community college instead of transferring straight to a four year. It is extremely rare, according to the literature, for false students to go from high school to a four year college. So they're opting to either going to a community college or are not going at all because again. Uh, many of them are not graduating at all. Here's a stat that the literature talks about. 70% of false youth, when you ask them if they uh, aspire to go to college, 70% of them say they aspire to go to college, but only 10% uh, only actually uh, go. 10% go, 3% will graduate. So in order for us to understand, you know, why this is this, this like this, we have to also understand the majority of false youth uh, they're they're changing uh, placement, so they're going from group homes, they're going to foster homes, they're changing placements all over. Uh, despite the fact that San Diego County specifically has tried to keep them in the communities that they grew up in, so that they can stay in a high school, uh, even then we're seeing that they're having to be shipped around. And the literature shows that when a child is moved from a different school, they lose six, six uh, at least six months worth of learning because they've changed schools. So you mix all this together, um, we begin to see that there is a huge um, uh, that there is a huge uh, achievement gap uh, that's going on uh, with our foster youth. Um, so, uh, oh, and also you're more likely if you are in foster care to have to be in special education um, as well. Uh, the literature talks about how there are certain steps that, that foster youth can take in order to go from from high school to four year, and one of them would be uh, that they would have to have high reading scores, that they would have to have stable placements and be labeled as gifted. As we all, as, I, as, I, as the points that I made, they show that these are not all, these are not uh, uh, terms that are often uh, associated with our foster youth. So here's something that a lot of people, you know, a lot of people often don't know about, but uh, Texas actually, became the first state in 1993 to offer foster youth a path um, to actually go to college for free. In the state of Texas right now, you can go to college from uh, from community college, four year, all the way up to a PhD for free, any state school. Uh, it's not like that here in San Diego, in California, uh, but again, in, in Texas, they became one of the first. So I've talked about in a literature review on campus uh, foster youth supported programs. There are currently some programs throughout the throughout the state um, of California, Texas, etc., where they have programs that are dedicated foster youth. The reason why in the literature I pointed out Texas is because the literature showed one of the studies that Texas offer free uh, waivers. However, uh, less than two percent of their foster youth are graduating. So it, it doesn't matter if they're providing them with the money to do it, if they don't have the program, a structured program and leaders in place who are able to lead these programs, then what ends up happening is these foster youth are uh, simply just uh, going in a motion and their, their, their aspirations to obtain the education have lessened uh, because of their experiences with an on-campus foster youth supported program that was not equipped to meet the needs of a foster youth. Is this law still in place? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, in California. I mean, Texas, yes. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Texas, of all places. <laughs> so here, um, I think it's important to talk about the on-campus foster youth program. Uh, one of the things that the research talked about was the autonomy. Right? Uh, students who experience foster care uh, decide to uh, participate in supportive programs because of autonomy and because of connection. So in my literature review, I have, thank you, I have, uh, I have bucket, uh, so, uh, second level title. Uh, level, two level, two, level two, level two headings, sorry. I have level two headings and one of them talks about connection. And a lot of them, uh, the literature shows that when they feel connected to an on-campus program, they're more likely to graduate and transfer to a four year. So these are some of the components of a four-year pro uh, of a, a community, and we're specifically talking about foster youth programs at community colleges. Some of the components of existing programs they're very, um, uh, I want to say, uh, they're similar in some ways. Uh, they offer academic counseling, they offer financial aid support, they offer uh, support with applying for scholarships, and, and etc. However, I say here 
The program support, support students that identify as foster youth are diverse in their services. So you can go to Miramar and receive different services at Miramar mm -hmm. than you do at Mesa. And that's confusing for some of the students. And often students are uh, removed from one district to another because of grades or whatever. So they may have had an a, a abundance of support at one campus, and when they go to another, they have no um, no support uh, like they had before. So. Uh, and all of this depends on the leaders, right? So the impact of leadership, right? So when, when a foster youth um, enrolls in college, they also find the college leadership uh, in individual departments lacking knowledge of resource services or uh, state and federal laws pertaining to support of foster youth. So they don't even understand the laws that are uh, currently in place to support foster youth, such as laws um, SB 150, which allows um, our foster youth to receive their Chafee grant regardless of whether they fail classes or not. If a school doesn't know something like that, they'll take away their Chafee, their Chafee check. Now the student is no longer want to be enrolled in school because now they're homeless. So um, these are some of the things that le as leaders we have to know about. And if we don't know about these things, we are causing more harm to our foster, our most vulnerable population on campus foster youth. Um, and so today, um, today uh, the research on this vulnerable population and, and leadership is limited. There's almost no uh, re, uh, literature that discusses the impact of, of leadership. And when I, refer, when I say leadership, I'm simply referring to the people who are in charge of these programs, the presidents of the school, and the dean. And so there, are, there isn't much study on these particular uh, two things. So I'll move into this, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll say this was this will sum it up. Uh, one of the things uh, when I was meeting with Dr. Uh, Dr. Mira, um, I said a quote, and I should point it because it was good. <laughs> they, in, they they want to include foster youth in uh, in equity conversations, but they don't want to include them in equity budgets. And so I think that that's something uh, that's very very important uh, for us to realize that when we begin to talk about social social justice and leadership, that we're going to talk about them in the conversation. We should include them in the budget as well because most foster youth programs at community colleges are simply ran off people who have a good heart and want to help the population, mm -hmm. which is unacceptable. And some of the areas for uh, uh, future research uh, is an imperative to review uh, what factors could influence their educational aspirations. With uh, further research, key factors can be identified to understand how leadership impacts foster youth and their educational outcome. So how does leadership impact the ability for a foster youth to go to college, attend college, uh, uh, graduate, and pursue their, uh, their, their academic goals? That's all I got for y'all. Great job, everyone. And I just want you to think, right? We keep thinking about this. A year ago, where were we? Ew. <laughs> <laughs> it's a year, a year down, right? A year down, two left. That's great. Like one third of the way done. Okay. So as you continue these last 12 days, Right? Why are you talking? Yeah. Why are you guys saying that? We celebrated. Now we're on to the next part. As you think about these 12 days, remember the work you've done. Celebrate that. Spend a little time in your paper, whatever you want to do. Little time off, little time in. But this is crunch time. Get in there and have some fun with it. And remember, it's all going to be fun. Uh, we're, we are here for you all the way till the last moment. Um, and <laughs> 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 that's on Monday morning, okay? Yeah, okay. That weekend and we're done. But anyway, just remember to make sure that you are happy with your work and it's your best work. And as long as it's that at this point, you're going to be grateful. Okay, so just remember that. Um, and then the other part is uh, we hope that you have like after the 13th, that you have a wonderful little debrief downtime, make sure you take it uh, so that you can be renewed when you come back in January. And then my own helpful hint as you move into your second year, and Grace would probably agree with this, is be thinking now about quant and qual. Mm -hmm. You had a little dip a year ago. Now you're gonna go hardcore into that. And when you go into that in January, be thinking, huh, Use the little examples they have, and what else did I already warn you to do? Think about your own data. Like, oh, I could look at African Americans, this, how would I get that data? Oh, I could look at that. 
and try to use real data in your examples as you're working through your qual and your quant. Even if you're a hundred percent a quant gal, Mason. <laughs> Maybe that. But when you're in the qual class, say, you know what? What could be my real data? Maybe it's some sort of thing about your students. Uh, sense of belonging that might be interesting, something like that, and use that. Do a little thing, get a little data from five kids, and then use it. Try to use it in the, the software they're doing. Try to use the types of data sets that you're going to use. Okay, do their little example one, and then try yours. Then do their example one, then try yours, and see how it fits. It will save you a lot of time later to not be like, what did I learn a year ago when I got to do this now? You will have tried it, and if I could give that's what I recommend. As you move into year two, and your year two is going to fly, and I'll be attending your proposal this time next year. <laughs> so finally, I mailed today to you a challenge coin. Okay, so I mailed you a challenge coin. I expect it back. <laughs> Two years from now. Ah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> a challenge coin. So normally you get a challenge coin. You're going to give it to someone, and when you graduate in three years, that person needs to give that coin back to you. So I, I'm giving it to you. I want you to give it back to me, and then I'm going to give it back to you uh, two years from now. Okay. So you're going to hold on to it. You're going to keep it. And two years from now, you'll give it to me, and I'll give it back to you. Um, so, two years from now, I will see you. Okay, so, please give it to me. I heard another story about challenge coins. I thought you were supposed to present them, and whoever didn't have them was great. Yes! <laughs> talking so what small liberal arts college did you go to and I said well I'll, I, I asked uh, just mm -hmm. and then I thought God, I went to that back in 1964 mm -hmm. 1968 mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, it just it really reminds me to renew myself continually and this class always does it for me because I see such an array of important topics that truly we see as you said will change the world. And that's what this program is all about. And so for me, again, it was a gift, a gift to be able with all. Um, we're here, we're available. If you want us to review something, let us know. If there's any burning questions, let us know. Whoa. What, what did it say? What did it say? Persistence pays off. So I opened a fortune cookie and it says persistence pays off. All right. That's all we needed. All right, everybody, wave. 
Uh, no, you said you're gonna sue me. Uh, no, no. Glasses over. Sarinara. De Niro. Paboom. Poof. See you next quarter. Winter quarter. JDP. 17. Out.